I'm so nervous. <laughs> Never done this before. You should be very nervous. Be afraid. Be very afraid. Here we go, gents. All right, everyone, it's time for Drummer Nation Live. Once again, the show where we talk drums and drumming with some of the best in the world. And I happen to have a few with me today. I'm lucky to have Mr. Adam Nussbaum, jazz drummer extraordinaire, and Paul Francis, who is an industry veteran, absolute guaranteed cymbal master. And I think I know quite a bit about cymbals, having had a cymbal company for 10 years. I would consider myself an expert. Paul's in a different league altogether. And we're glad that they're both here with us. Let's get it rolling right now. Stay with us. It's time for Drummer Nation. Hey, everybody. How you doing? This is Bobby A. And today I wanted to tell you about how much I really love the Hudson Music digital app. Okay, now, check it out. It's an app that you can get for your device, and you can purchase books from the Hudson Music Digital Store and have them stored right on your device. The great thing about it is you always have it with you, and any content that might be video-related or music-related is right there at your fingertips. It's a wonderful resource. Hello everyone, my name is David Victor. I'm general manager with the Craviato Drum Company. We wanted to offer a one-ply, solid shell product, but we wanted it to stay true to our mission of offering handmade drums of uncompromised quality built here in the USA. So take a listen to our Center Stage Series drum set. All right, as promised, here they are, two fine gentlemen, Adam Nussbaum in the middle, Paul Francis on the right. Welcome, guys. Thanks for doing the show. Thank you. Our Thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Michael. Well, you know, this isn't an interview show because uh, I just wanted to be a hang. And I got two guys on that know a little something about symbols. Paul, how long did you work uh, for Zildjian in this making symbols? Uh, 32 years. <laughs> See, it makes my 10 look like nothing. <laughs> and, and Adam, I know you're a, a veteran jazz musician, but you also have worked with Paul uh, on cymbals in the past too, right? Yep. I uh, remember when Paul first got the job up there at Zildjian. I uh, first got connected with uh, the Zildjian company, I believe it was in 1983. Great. And then I think Paul got there around 89 or so, right? Yeah, it was it was the end of 1988 into 89, and mm. and I had just come uh, back from New York uh, from Drummers Collective, and I got to see Adam play quite a bit um, at the bottom line with uh, Michael Brecker and his group. So yeah. when I saw when I saw Adam walk by one day when I was on a lathe, I lit up like a Christmas tree because now I'm like, <laughs> well, here's a guy that was on stage and somebody that I had read about you know, in the various, uh, you know, magazines. And now I can actually um, talk to him. And, and that's what I did. He was walking by and I said, hey, Adam, like I, I, I should have called you Mr. Nussbaum. But and you stopped and, and, and you chatted with me. And it was really, really fantastic for a, uh, a 20 year old drummer. Well, let me talk. I know Adam's going to be humble, so I'm going to keep moving. Let's talk about symbols, all right? The first thing I want to touch on, and Paul, I want your response on this, is the secret formula idea. Because uh, I found out there's a thing called a, a mass spectrometer. They had mm -hmm. one at Sabian. And what it is, for people who don't know, Paul, these guys know it, but it, it's a nuclear-level device that costs like $100,000, and you point it at a piece of metal, and it tells you what's in it to the trace elements. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, you know, they don't send people up in space shuttles with a guy knocking on the panel going, yeah, that seems about right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's got to be more uh, uh, credibility to the whole thing than that. So I began to look at not a, a formula in terms of, because they all come up, we tested tons of them, all the brands, they all come up essentially 20% copper, I mean, 80% copper, 20% tin. So I would, I would propose that it's more like a recipe 
you know, what is the shape of the product that you're starting with? Is it new or recycled? What is the oven? Is it properly made? Is it electric or gas? Is it properly maintained? How long is it in? Um, and then the whole process from then on is what each company does a little differently. Would you agree with that or not, Paul? And feel free to disagree. Yes, it, it's, it's, it's a process and, you know, it's, it's widely guarded, you know, at, at several of the, the companies where you're not allowed into the foundry. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was not privy to how the process was performed um, at Zildjian, but I'll tell you this. I was working on a, on a project years ago, um, which ended up being the Avidus uh, product, which was a kind of throwback to some really early A's um, back in the 50s, beginning of the 60s. And I did work with a uh, metallurgical firm to see if there was a way to take a brand new symbol and age it uh, so it sounded, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old. So I did, you know, I sent them um, a brand new symbol that had been a day old, one that was a week, one that was a month, uh, all the way up to 70 years. And I asked them to look at, at the um, the grain structure and the crystal structure and everything and say, you know, what what is changing with the metal and is there a way to accelerate that? And um, after a lot of analysis and going back and forth, uh, these, these metallurgists that, you know, they, they work on um, plane crashes and stuff. I mean, they're, they're NASA level um, engineers. And they said, you know, the, the metal does change over time, but we can't tell you what to do. Oh, and by the way, that 8020 bronze uh, is pretty special the way that we're seeing it under the, uh, the electron microscopes and stuff, because it's not um, typical to uh, a mass produced uh, 8020 bronze on an industrial scale. So they did say whatever you're doing in that room is is special. So you know it's I think there was a, a an understanding way back when you know almost 400 years ago of you know different metals uh, and and what to do and how to approach it and that's what was applied to this type of bronze. Um, so that that you know is it secret? Yeah, sort of, kind of, maybe, but is it a, a, a widely held kind of to the vast process? Yes. Yes. Cool. No, that's a great answer. Yeah. Um, well, let's look at the, the, the playing part of it. Adam, what are you looking for in a ride symbol, for example? Well, generally speaking, within the jazz idiom, the ride symbol in conjunction with the bass kind of helps to frame the groove of the band. Like I like to say, I like to hear the spittle a ding going with the ickety boom. And I want to have a ride symbol that makes it a pleasant journey for the rest of the band to ride on. I think that's a, an adequate description. You want to have something that gives you definition Mm -hmm. But you also have to give them enough of a foundation of such that supports them in such a way that they can feel like they're being given a nice ride. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's a good term for it, a ride symbol. Uh, I try to have something where it enables me to hear everything else in the band. It's a it's almost like a balance of opposite elements I want to have working in harmony. I want definition of my articulation, but I also need enough wash and body to help give support to what's happening with the rest of the group. I uh, am very enamored with symbols where I can articulate different manners of hitting it where I can utilize the tip, I can utilize the shank of the stick. I like to be able to have a symbol where when I shank it, it can open up, but then come back quickly so the overtones don't overpower the articulation of the uh, beat. 
And I, I like a, a symbol that can respond and have those characteristics. Uh, and depending on the kind of music that you're playing, you'll find that something that works in an all acoustic situation may not be functional within an all electric situation and vice versa. You have mm -hmm. to have the right tools for the job. And uh, everybody has a different embouchure. You know, the way they hold the stick is different with everybody. And the stick you use. And at the end of the day, we have to remember it's the uh, painter, not just the brush. Precisely. Uh, I think in terms of stick versus wash, what about you guys? You know what I mean? You need to have the definition of the, 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 the stick hitting the symbol. A ting, a ta, a da, whatever it is. And then there's some people want a heavier symbol that's going to be ping, 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 and maybe mm -hmm. a little more bite, a little more cut. Some people want a thinner symbol that's going to be more like a da, 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 with a little more subtlety to the bottom end of it, maybe shoulder strikes, all that stuff. And, and it's accommodated by the way we play it, but also by the way it's made. Yes, sure. Well, I mean, the, the get... shape of the symbol, how it's hammered, how it's treated. I mean, it's a piece of metal. Mm -hmm. So Paul knows <coughs> better than you as well. Michael, everything that's done in the process is going to affect it. What's the shape of it? How is it hammered? How is it laid? How is it buffed? All these factors contribute to mm -hmm. its sonic character. And what I, I got... found when I was working with artists, Paul, is that they yep. know what they want. <coughs> uh from a standpoint of sound right yep. but we have to convert that into well does that mean the symbol should be flatter should be more bowed should be thicker thinner how are the edges you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's one thing well, to say i'd like to hear this but another one to know what to do to make that and that's kind of what we we're involved in especially you um uh, Absolutely. Um, I had several great teachers, um, but the, the overall and I'll and I'll get into who they are um, with regard to symbol making and symbol sounds. Um, but the overall factor is that every symbol you should be able to ride, every symbol you should be able to crash. Mel Lewis. Yep. Uh, and Armin Zildjian taught me that. He said every you should just be able to pick up a paper thin symbol and and, <coughs> and, and ride it and hear um, some stick definition on it and you know you should be able to pick up a ride symbol that's heavier be able to crash it where it, it, it's not annoying sounding so I had I had Armand I had Lenny DiMuzio and I also had Leon Chiappini who was a head symbol tester for for a long long time and in addition to those guys I had people like Adam and, and a you know cavalcade of artists that I learned from um, so yes, you know, you, you, it's a piece of metal, like Adam said, and I keep looking down at a symbol that I have next to me. Um, and, and there's no moving parts, nothing gets put together. There's nothing assembled with it. Um, you know, like a drum, you know, or a guitar or a bass, you know, it's one piece of metal. You roll it out to a, a you know, thickness or a thinness. You decide what bell goes in, what cup shape. Um, how are you going to, to hammer it? And there's really only two ways to hammer it. You hammer it all over the place. So you put in hammer rows okay? and those give you two different sound characteristics for the most part. And then you're going to well, shave. Let's talk about that. that. That's right up my alley though. The hammering okay. is it, um, tell me those two methods again. Well, you know, you, you can have, um, a symmetrical where you have hammer rows or mm -hmm. you have asymmetrical or some people call it random. Um, you know, and that's more associated with, with hand hammering, which I've been doing quite a bit of lately, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, it is, is fun in its own right. Uh, but usually when, when there's, um, hammer rows, you know, if we talk about, uh, an A Zildjian or Sabian AA or a Peisty 2002, everything's lined up nice and even, and you usually get a, a nice cleaner, prettier sound. And then if you're, you're sitting you know, at an amble with the hammer in your hand, which I had been doing all morning before this, um, you know, you, you tend to get something that could be a little bit uh, more complex, uh, darker uh, type of sound. It's, it's not a better sound, 
you know, that, that's really up to the player to determine. There, there's no such thing as this is the best sound because you might hate it and somebody else loves it. That's a very uh, good they, point. You know, when I had my, let me jump in for a second, Paul. When I had my company, yeah. uh, we all we did was hand hammered cymbals and we, sure. we tried to make that our defining characteristic, but we never said that it was better or worse than any other type. If that's the sound you're looking for, we found the only way to make it was to hand hammer it. But there sure. are plenty of other sounds, and there's mixtures of hand machine, uh, handmade mm -hmm. or machine made, or any variation therein. And they Absolutely. all yield different means palettes. To means to an end, Mike. You know, mm -hmm. what are you trying to accomplish for sound? And, you know, how, however, the, the symbol factory gets there, that's great. And then that helps drummers find their sounds so they can express themselves non verbally. That's what we're doing as drummers within the band situation. Exactly. And, you know, you and I were competitors, but would always go over. Here's a picture of us uh, at one of the trade yes. show booths. That's got to be your booth. I never had one that big <laughs> uh, at Zildjian. But um, it's funny because everybody in the industry knows each other, and we all go around and play everybody's cymbals at all mm -hmm. these events, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, it wasn't always that way, you know. Um, they People didn't travel to the other booths. Uh, I would really? say 35 years ago it was kind of taboo. And I, I like that part, man. I'll go talk to Kelly Peisty and talk to all the people, you and the others at Zildjian and uh, Andy at Sabian and um, uh, Andy Morris at Dream. And, I mean, we all knew each other, right? right? Armand and Mehmet and all those cats were all in the same industry. We we're trying to sell symbols. <laughs> right. And, yeah. uh, I don't think there was any animosity between between individuals. Everybody's trying to put the other one out of business, but that's just business. You know, I, I think there's always been a mutual respect yeah. among people that are good at what they do. Right. And like everybody's got a slightly different. Yeah. yeah, there's always a little different spin on how you look at something and amen for that. Amen for that. It, it was good for the drummers. Competition is good. You know, are you right? There, there's a saying, you know, in business, I, I do a lot of reading, you know, if if one competitor gets knocked out of the marketplace, someone else fills that spot. They don't, you know, that 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 spot doesn't stay void or, or two other competitors. You know, if there's usually three major players in any category, right. you know, if some if someone falls out, someone else takes that place. It doesn't get split up between the, the other two. It just doesn't happen because, you know, we we as people we we like to have variety. So again, exactly. the drummers win. The drummers the drummers won more over the last 25, 30 years than uh, previous. I think. Yeah. Now let's talk, uh, Adam, about not only designing symbols but as an artist. You've been with Zildjian a long time. That means it made you happy. What is it an artist needs from a symbol company? Well, I think what's been wonderful is to be able to have the opportunity to work with the people that make the product and try to develop things. I mean, one of the great relationships that I had with Paul was that I could go to him and say, you know, there's this symbol and there's something about it that I really like, but there's some other dimensions that I'm looking for. How do you think you may be able to achieve that? And, you know, nothing was magic. It wasn't like he just said, poof, this is going to be it. You know, there, it, this would be part of a process of trying different things, trying different moves here and there. I mean, I remember one day, I remember this distinctly. I was at the factory and I was looking at the bin of rejects where for some reason, maybe it was a cosmetic issue or something. And I saw a K custom, which was an unlaid symbol. And I pulled it out and I played it and I said, this is a nice pie. And it had like, I think a little gouge in it or something. And I said, you know, I'd love to hear what this would be like if you maybe you thinned it out and did some little extra stuff to it. How would that be? And that ended up, becoming the pre-aged symbol. So 
I think, and also in the process of developing different lines, you would take certain characteristics from one and try to apply it into another and see how these things all come together. So that was a great thing for me to be able to have that and also to have the scrutiny of the elders, which Mm -hmm. I find is always great to have when you have somebody there like a Leon or a Lanny or Armin, you know, we've all learned from the elders. I mean, this is all the process of part of the way things go in the tradition, you know, Mm -hmm. people help to build foundations and we try to absorb that and then continue and try to pay forward. So, uh, I found that that was a, a fascinating process and, you know, nothing was magic. We went through quite a few different incarnations of trying the, uh, to come up with the Renaissance, which was something that we came up with. And uh, I was just very grateful that, you know, the company and Paul were receptive to my, my annoyance. (laughs) I'm sure it wasn't that, Uh, you know, I've got, we don't have a long show, but I've got some clips of you guys. Let me start with Adam and I have a Uh clip of him playing. Be careful. (laughs) Tell, tell, you want to tell us what this is? We'll let it play and talk to us later. You know, I don't know what you're going to show, okay, so let's right. see what all I right. know. Or here what we I go. Know. I copped it from Drummer World. I don't know where he copped it, but here it is. Uh-oh. <laughs> ah. He's really working at some of Okay, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna stop it there, man. That's just wonderful. Uh, my observations are, uh, well, your cymbal sounds are wonderful. You know, you've got some rivets. I think you're working on there. Oh yeah, I actually believe that's an old, like twenty one and a half inch Turkish K that I had for many years. I had like a new little dark crash over there. Um, that gig was in 1987 with the, uh, great Toot Steelman's. That's a, it was a very fun band, Fred Hirsch on piano and Harvey Swartz. That was a, a good night, uh, because we were doing something for German television. I think it was in Stuttgart. Jerry Mulligan was also there. Betty Carter was there. So there was a good hang, uh, the, 
Swiss drummer Daniel Humer was there. So it was inspiring to have some of the uh, the cats and the kitties out there. And Toots was a uh, incredible, uh, incredible musician. You know, he's the he's the the voice of the Midnight Cowboy in Sesame Street playing uh, the harmonica. He also did a lot of gigs whistling, mm -hmm. where he did the Old Spice commercial. Mm -hmm. And uh, Toots was a, a guy who kind of gave you a green light, which was nice for as a band leader. It's like, you know, you play nice for him, you support him, and then it's like, go ahead, cats, you all got it. <laughs> well, so, you uh, played with great actually, intensity. Go ahead. He, he would have turned 100 this year. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. I know you miss him. You played with great intensity and fire, but also nuance and space <laughs> and uh, dynamics. And well, I'm trying to play the tune. That was the tune all blues. You know, it can be mm -hmm. three, it can be four, it can be six, it can be eight. And uh, a lot you know, of metric every, modulation in there, too. Yeah, you know, I don't know what you call it, man. But what <laughs> I like is that everybody is listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my, my favorite players, the guys that play the best generally hear the best. Yeah, it's been said listening is more important than playing. Yeah. Because I mean, it's, it's it very important what you play. to. Yeah. It'd be very important to be involved in the subject and the process of mm -hmm. what's going on. And, you know, I used to bring those old symbols up to Paul and I'd say, Hey man, can we try to get something like this happening? <laughs> and I'm sure he could. Well, Paul is, is no secret now that he's left Zildjian and we're not here to talk about that, but he is making some symbols on his own. Tell us about that, Paul. And then I have some examples to show everyone. Well, you know, I kind of joke I should have my head examined, you know, <laughs> um, but, you know, having having done it my whole adult life, um, you know, it's like playing the drums. I've, I've played the drums longer than I've been a cymbal maker. And, you know, I, I you need to do it. You know, a painter needs to paint. Drummer needs to drum. Cymbal maker needs to make cymbals. So, um, you know, it, it, it's just something that that feeds my soul. So that's why I do it. And, you know, thank God some people are, are interested. And Amen. Amen. I'm, of course I'm they are. It again. And I just have my own little kind of workshop here in, in my garage and, and I'm making symbols every day and I'm not trying to take over the world or anything. I'm, I'm just feeding my soul. Beautiful. And are you hand hammering these? Yes. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. I could tell by what I heard, but I, I know you as well. Uh, well, you know what I cautioned you is I, I wanted to said, man, don't kill yourself making this a global brand and trying to make, you know, 100 symbols a week. You, you kill yourself. But uh, you got the right idea. You can do what you do because you love it and put them out there. And people are digging them, man. And, and why wouldn't they? I mean, <laughs> uh, one of the master symbolsmiths in the world. So I have a video of one of your, you're going the dealer route with some select dealers. And this is Steve Maxwell showing off is new and tell us what they're called uh the 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 name of of them is just called symbol craftsman you know i i i took my instagram handle that i established some years ago mm -hmm. and decided to apply that to um the symbols and it's just right. it's just simple well let's watch uh, it's, it's a good name let's watch uh, steve talk about them this will run a few minutes Hey everybody, Steve here. All right, what could be better? Come on, I mean, come on. Surrounded by symbols, how does it get any better than this? And these are all Paul Francis's symbols. Not all, I take that back. This is some of the 62 that we have. So, uh, we are obviously in my recording studio in the Illinois store. We will have these at the Chicago show, uh, May 21st and May 22nd. They are here in my shop now. I've got some pre-orders to fill on Monday, but then if folks wanna come in and check them out, uh, that's fine. Come on in and check them out. We actually have white gloves to handle them with. I'm not going to touch them, but I'm going to give you a little example of some of this. This stuff is great, and as, as uh, Steve Jr. just said, you know, there's something here for everybody. There's a great mix of sounds and everything going here. So I just got one pair of hats up here that I just put up, uh, and I did a little video with these. We also have everything from 18s and 19s, hats of 14s and 15s, 
There are 2021 and 22 rides or crash rides, however you want to use them. And there is a 26, and this 26 is already spoken for. There's only one. But uh, give me a little example. So this is the 26. It's another great one, gate 20. Now here's, here's one that's kind of in the tradition of the Bill Stewart ride, and you'll understand when you hear it. So a little bit of a sample of everything else we got up here. And these 18s and 19s, they make great rides. I mean, fantastic stuff. Okay, I'm gonna stop it there. He's a he's a he's a kid in a candy store there, and uh, I know how he feels because I remember when they used to come in by the hundreds. I'd get there and play them like that. Uh, nice pies, Paul. Very nice. Thank you. I I, I continued. You know, I, I literally went back to the woodshed and just practiced um, my craft, and I didn't know anybody would care. And you know, I had known Steve for a long, long time, and after I had kind of posted a picture on, on Instagram back at the end of March, he, he contacted me and said, you know, let's talk. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a big drum store guy. I mean, I, I grew up going to music stores and drum stores. I, I pretty much spent a lot of time at Dick DeCenzo's drum shop in Quincy, Massachusetts throughout mm -hmm. my, mm -hmm. my uh, high school years. And, um, you know, I've done a lot of, uh, in-store events at different drum stores around the world. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have to continue to support these types of drum stores. That's a very um, good point. When I had yeah. my company, we were always being asked to go direct, which mm -hmm. means in their words, it meant selling directly to end users, which mm -hmm. uh, we never did. And even if, uh, if it appeared as though you're doing it at a trade show booth or something, that's all worked out behind the scenes with the dealers. Right, uh, right. So I always looked at it as that's their job. I have enough jobs to make and produce and distribute and market and all that stuff. And uh, I don't think it's ever worth the uh, cutting off dealers to to try to make a few extra points on your own. Uh, mm -hmm. So Steve Maxwell is one of the premier dealers in the, in the country. Uh, is he your only dealer or you have a few more? No, I have a few more. I mean, um, Steve, Steve made some phone calls after. And mm -hmm. then I, I started to... Um, you know, get, get some requests. So I'm, I'm in the middle of making stuff for three more dealers. Um, you know, Can you like, name uh, them? I imagine um, they're the premier guys. Yeah. Memphis I'd drum shop. Yes. Yeah. Jim Columbus row, uh, another Jim place Rowe. out, uh, in California that was new to me. This guy just cold called me, uh, round sound symbols out in Oakland, California. Yeah. I don't know that. You know, oh, invariably cool. for me, I have to play a symbol to hear it, you know, Mm -hmm. It's nice that there's the availability of things online and great like that in that regard. And amen for that. But for me, you know, the bottom line is I need to hear the symbol in the band. I need to hear it around the music and in the context of how it's going to be utilized. Yeah, and it's also a stick, right? I mean, you need to feel the oh, stick. Oh, totally, totally. You know, uh, the uh, stick, uh, you know, it's like you get 10 different piano players playing the same piano. They're all going to get a different sound. You get 10 different drummers playing the same cymbal. Everybody's going to have a different embouchure, different touch, different stick. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to sound different. Right. But, but on the so other hand, those people, if you live 500 miles from a dealer, you can get in the ballpark. 
Yep. Yes, you can. You yep. can. I'm just spoiled. You know, I never <laughs> lived more than an hour from, uh, you know, New York City. So I used to go to Frank Ippolito's Professional Percussion Center. I used to go to Manny's. I used to go to these places and, mm -hmm. you know, you'd pick out a symbol and there'd, there'd be Joe Jones over your shoulder looking at you, shaking his head. <laughs> Not like that, young man, you know, so I'm, I'm so grateful to have been spoiled by these, you know, situations. Well, Adam, let's talk but about this your... is true. It's, it's great that they have now the ability to, you know, get good sounds together, mic things well and check. Cause like you said, if you live in the middle of nowhere, you know, you got to be able to have this opportunity mm -hmm. Yeah, and hooray for technology. Well, here In we that are using regard. it. Yeah, we're down with it. We're, we're using it right now. Uh, Adam, I, I couldn't bring up a, a, a video or an audio from your, your current project because I get busted by the Facebook or YouTube police. But tell us about <laughs> your, pro, your, your present project. Well, a project that I organized a few years ago directly relates to my initial musical inspiration. And... Um, you know, when you're a little boy, a little child, and it used to be you'd go through your parents' record collection and, you know, I got some of them there in the background, and blah, blah, blah. You know, my parents had all kinds of records. They, they listened to all kinds of music, classical, jazz, folk, blues, you name it. And they had 10-inch LPs by Lead Belly. And... On one of them, there was a man wearing a bandana and overalls. And then another one was the same guy wearing a three-piece suit and a 12-string guitar. And I was fascinated because he was this very black man, salt and pepper hair, and these piercing eyes. So as a little boy, I listened to these records all the time. Rock Island Line, Good Night Irene, all those kind of tunes. And so I was thinking, let me put something together that's different than anything I've been involved in. Because I've been so fortunate to get to play with so many great musicians, but I wanted to put something together that related to my initial stimulus. So I put this band together and I couldn't find any 12 string guitar players. So I got two great six string guys. And I got a wonderful saxophonist named Ohad Talmor. The guitar players are Steve Cardenas and Nate Radley. And we're just using that music as a springboard to explore what can happen. And it's been a lot of fun. And people say, well, how come you don't have a bass player? It's like, well, I got two guitar players. You know what I mean? I need more strings up there. You know, you got two guys that know how to listen. Somebody stays uptown. Somebody stays downtown. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also opens up the uh, options as far as what can happen without a bass because uh creates another environment. And I love bass more than anything. I think, you know, I got my groove together by playing with great bass players. So What's the name of the group, this has though? been a very fun project for me. Tell Excuse us the me. Name. Tell us the name of the group. It's just the Adam Nussbaum Lead Belly Project. Lead Belly Project. Right. And we, we have two CDs out. One is called The Lead Belly Project. And uh, on that one, I picked out all the music. And then for the second one, I said to the cats who've got to play the melodies and everything, I said, hey, guys, you know, let's see if you can find some other Lead Belly material you want to play. And I'll hand it over to you, you know. I don't want to be a uh, adamant dictator. I like it to be a democratic dem uh, dictatorship. <laughs> so I let them pick out the music for the second CD, and that was called Lead Belly Reimagined. Cool. So, you know, we get to work once in a blue moon, and it's always very satisfying. And every night it's a new adventure. So mm -hmm. it's been a lot of fun. Now you're starting to work more now with post-COVID too, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, tomorrow night I'm in a, the real hot seat. Uh, there's a project. I'm actually wearing a T-shirt that says the Elvin Jones Lighthouse Project. 
Mm -hmm. um, Dave Liebman and Gene Perla were members of Elvin's band 50 years ago when they did a record called Live at the Lighthouse along with Steve Grossman. Mm -hmm. And uh, so tomorrow we have a gig in Manhattan with another great tenor player because Steve Grossman left Jerry Berganzi. And I'm in the hot seat, so we're going to be playing some of that music from uh, that recording, which was uh, 50 years ago. So mm -hmm. great. It should be a fun adventure tomorrow night. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. Now, Paul, you're a, a drummer as well, right? I don't know anybody in the industry side who's not also a drummer. I've been playing for 44 years, and now I'm playing more drums than ever now. I play in three different uh bands two two cover bands and one rockabilly band and the rockabilly band's doing a lot of um a lot of gigging which is it, it's a lot of fun because it's it, you're swinging you know rockabilly drumming right. is, is is swinging mm -hmm. um and you know after i'm done um doing this with you i'm actually off to a, a band rehearsal which is great and you know playing drums another thing that feeds my soul you know, it, it, it's great. It's my first, first love, first girlfriend, as I like to tell people. My mistress. That's right. <laughs> Duke Ellington, there was that book written about uh, called Music is My Mistress. That's right. That's right. We all know what he means. You right? know, I, I feel uh, like I'm starting to get the hang of it. You'll figure it out <laughs> eventually. I know it's a process, you know, like, like I tell all the youngsters, you can't Google experience. That's right. And what do we say after the gigs? Just like we rehearsed it. Or, uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Pull them again. <laughs> I can't, I can't do the same thing once. Yeah. That was, um, <laughs> that was dizzy, right? Dizzy. We can't, we I think I, it I was... can't play the same thing. I don't, we don't play the same thing once. I don't know. I think uh, the, the other line I heard was that it was attributed to Shelly Mann. Jazz is not playing the same thing once. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Both good lines. All right, who's, guys. Who's to else? say? Go ahead. No, it's just great that you're putting this together, Michael, and, you yeah. know, taking advantage of the technology. And well, you it's know, always thank, good to see. Thank you. But you know what, what occurred to me is wouldn't it be great if we had these from the 60s? The 50s oh, and the 60s and all those yeah. great drummers that could just shoot the shit like we're doing. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it'd be great to see. I'd love to see Joe Jones talking with Woo! his contemporaries and Shelly and Mel and all those guys later on oh, and, and, you know, everybody. Uh, well, so I, I, you guys are no slouches either, so I'm delighted you're well, here and I appreciate you doing this. You. I'm going to go to a couple of spots on the way out and wrap it up with a, a theme. But uh, I want to thank my guests, Adam Nussbaum and Paul Francis. And I try to do different guests every week. And last week, somebody came in on the fly when somebody else was having trouble getting in. So I'm going to continue to call on my pals to come and hang with me on, on uh, it says, it's most Wednesdays. So we don't answer to anybody. It was a Thursday last week. It might be a Tuesday. We might skip a week. But um, I really appreciate my pals for helping me out. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Great right. to see everybody. Yes. And Stay gonna... safe, everyone out there in Cyberland. Keep Indeed. swinging. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, man. Drummers Thank who you. prefer dark symbols with fast responses will love the HH Vanguard series from Sabian. Vanguard provides an elegant, complex sound that is always musical. Each model is fully hand hammered to be thin and light with a flatter profile for a deep fundamental tone and a smaller, musically integrated bell. The result is a clean, woody stick definition with exceptional articulation and responsiveness. Find detailed information at sabian.com slash vanguard. Memphis Drum Shop is the world's premier provider of percussion instruments. With six showrooms of gear, mysymbol.com, the Memphis Gong Chamber, and a first-rate repair department, turn to Memphis Drum Shop for all your percussion needs.